the institution I want to touch on in my uh, comments to you now is our criminal justice system. Um, and I only have time, as Sonia said, to give you a snapshot uh, of where things stand concerning its handling of rape cases. Um, the quickest way to sum it up is um, we've come a long way. We still have a very long way to go. Uh, a generation ago, hardly any rape case I have See you nodding as one who as one who's in there. Um, a generation ago, hardly any rape cases were ever prosecuted. And when a rape case went to trial, the trial was often described as a second rape for the victim. It's not like that anymore. And the reason it's not like that anymore is that feminists got out and fought for change and made change happen. But we are still a very long way from where we should be. Uh, and in recent years, we haven't seen enough progress in this area partly because we haven't been making enough noise in this area. And so a year ago, our chapter, Now NYC, launched a vigorous campaign called Take Rape Seriously. This panel is part of that campaign, and our work on criminal justice is also part of that campaign. And I want to give you a few quick examples um, of the many changes still needed in our criminal justice system. I'll touch on three areas. Um, the laws that are on the books um, as they pertain to sexual assault, the laws as they're being interpreted by the courts, and the implementation of the law by law enforcement. And again, just a few quick examples. So the laws as they're on the books. Um, this is an area where in recent years now, NYC has actually had some tremendous victories. In just the last few years, our chapter has waged successful campaigns to eliminate the statute of limitations on rape cases, to um, get New York State to pass its first law against human trafficking. Um, to get a law passed against strangulation attacks, which are very commonly part of sexual assault, but weren't considered assaults until two years ago. Um, and last year, we pushed through a law to keep guns out of the hands of batterers. Um, <laughs> Did you say duh? No. <laughs> um, there's still a lot of changes needed to our laws. I want to give you a, a couple of quick examples. So in New York State, the laws are very archaic pertaining to sexual abuse and exploitation of women and girls who are um, mentally disabled or who are too intoxicated to be able to consent. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a very difficult threshold, a very narrow definition of what constitutes men, mental disability, what constitutes incapable of consent. Um, prosecutors who want to charge these cases are finding that the laws are too restrictive and that the cases get dismissed. Um, other states have better definitions of what constitutes a mental disability, what constitutes too drunk to consent um, to sex. New York State should be looking at some of those better definitions and, and, and adopting them. Um, another quick example, uh, legislative reform. If a rape case goes to trial and the victim testifies, let's say she's been convicted of shoplifting. She can be cross-examined up and down by the defense attorney about that shoplifting conviction and all the details of it and why it reflects badly on her credibility. Let's say now the defendant, the guy who's accused of rape, let's say he's got seven prior convictions for sexual assault. The jury, in almost every case, very, very rare exceptions, the jury will never be allowed to know that the guy is a seven-time convicted rapist. Where did I get the number seven? From a real case, People versus Vargas, uh, where the guy's conviction was overturned because the trial judge had ruled that the jury could find out a very limited amount of information about this rapist's seven prior convictions. Um, that's just crazy. <laughs> it's, an, it, it's an area we'd like to work on. Um, as the new legislative session approaches, we'll be looking at the issues I've just mentioned and other lingering injustice for women uh, in our laws, and we'll be deciding which of them look right for reform. I hope you'll watch for our action alerts, and I hope that you'll be with us. Um, second area, the laws as they're being interpreted by our courts. And I'm sorry to say that here, um, in recent years, not only has progress kind of stalled, but we've even seen some backsliding in terms of how our appellate judges are interpreting our laws on rape. One example, we're seeing a real undermining um, of the rape shield law. A horrible case called People v. Hunter in which a, a woman um, was testifying in a rape trial. Uh, she was uh, uh, the, the victim who had reported being raped. In an unrelated case, she had been raped by a different man. Now, if you crunch the statistics on how many rapes are occurring in our society, it's not at all unlikely that a woman could be raped twice in her life in two utterly unrelated incidents, okay? 
the, the, the appellate court overturned this man's conviction, saying that the defense counsel should have been able to seek to cross-examine her about that unrelated rape case, even though at the time the appeals court heard the case, the guy in the unrelated case had pled guilty. So the court knew that she had been telling the truth in that other case, and still said, no, nope, getting raped twice, that's a little fishy. The defense attorney should have been able to cross-examine her about an utterly unrelated rape, even though we know it really happened. Um, the takeaway here is it matters who's on the courts, and it matters who's on the appellate courts. Um, I've been shocked, in fact, by some of the misogyny that I've seen in New York City and New York State uh, judges. Um, what is now NYC doing about that? Well, one thing we can do is support pro-woman candidates for judicial appointments. Right now, we're very proud to be supporting a judge named Doris Lynn Cohen, a longtime champion of marriage equality, a champion against domestic violence, and um, we are lobbying the governor um, to appoint her to a higher court. Um, do we have letters available tonight? Yeah, we, we have letters available for you to sign in support of, uh, of Judge Lynn Cohen. Um, on the appellate courts, don't underestimate the difference that a few forceful voices for women can make. We've seen that, and we're trying to get more of them. In the third area, and again, this is just skimming the surface, but our laws as they're being implemented by law enforcement. So how well are the laws against sexual assault being carried out by our police and prosecutors? This wait while you wonder about that. <laughs> is this mine? Okay. <laughs> the answer is, it's a very, very mixed bag. In the police department, there's a wide range of quality of work being done by cops, some very good work, some very bad work. Um, and we saw some shakeups in the NYPD last year on this issue. They didn't come a moment too soon. Um, among DA's offices, it's really important to understand that every district attorney in every county is their own independent elected official with jurisdiction only over that county. Some of them are doing really good work on crimes against women, some of them are doing really bad work. But in general, as we look around at the various offices, what we are still seeing far too much of is prosecutors asking the question, is this the kind of rape that matters? Is this the kind of rape victim who matters?